Good evening and uh, good morning, <laughs> depending where you are. Also, good afternoon. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Henry Huiya Wang. I I'm the founder and the president of Center for China and Globalization. I'm very pleased and honored to host uh, 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 CCG Global Dialogue Series tonight here in Beijing at head office uh, uh, in the central <laughs> business district at uh, uh, in Beijing downtown. And uh, we are live here from uh, CCG uh, Beijing office. So we are very uh, pleased to actually invited the very uh, distinguished uh, speakers for our, our dialogue tonight. Uh, you know, we had uh, Professor uh, Mahubani, uh, uh, Kishu Mahubani, and uh, we also had Professor uh, Carrie Brown. We also had Professor uh, Ken Calder. And uh, so we were, we're gonna talk about uh, the rise of, uh, and also the rise of Asia and its implications for increasingly uh, multipolar world. I would like to we start with a book. You know, recently we have uh, a new book that uh, it's called uh, Asian 21st Century, uh, written and by uh, uh, Professor Kishu Malbani and actually published by uh, uh, Springer Nature and is only published about two weeks. We had 44,000 downloads already worldwide. So, so we're going to talk from that book on, but that, but we're going to have a wide range of topic on the. Uh, issue of Asia uh, uh, development and also the impact of the world. So maybe let's take a quick uh, look at the, how the book uh, is, is, is uh, a quick uh, a video on the book. So let's take a look. Great, thank you. So we actually had the book uh, uh, launching event last, uh, uh, you know, about a, a week or so ago. But uh, but I'm very glad that uh, today we are going to have a, a, a more uh, a focused, uh, you know, dialogue and of course also a topic uh, uh, rising from 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 here. But also, you know, we can cover a, a wide range of uh, a topic regarding uh, Asian and its uh, a multipolar world. Uh, so maybe t t tonight, you know, I'd like to uh, uh, have a, uh, you know, this dialogue between three prominent uh, scholars, you know, one from Singapore, one from USA, and one from uh, UK. Of course, I'm from China. So, so what I uh, would like first to introduce uh, uh, Kishu, probably you could, uh, you know, give a bit of a, a, a rundown of your book, but let me first introduce uh, Professor Kishu Malbani, and he's a distinguished fellow at the Asian Research Institute. Uh, at the National University of Singapore. And of course, uh, you are the founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and also Singapore's former ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, but also you are a, a prominent voice in the world of affairs, especially uh, in regard to the issues uh, on Asia and, and US-China relations and global governance. So, so I think, you know, it's, it's probably <laughs> we're gonna have you to start to give us a, uh, some new introduction about this new book you, you had just published and uh, how, how the Asian, you know, the, the return of Asian are uh, going to impact, uh, 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 you know, uh, China and, and, and also the US and the EU and of course the rest of the world. So perhaps uh, uh, I, I start with Kishu first. Professor uh, Malabani, you, you're... Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry, for organizing this event and I'm really glad that you managed to get two very distinguished scholars, Professor Kerry Brown and Professor Ken Calder to join us for this event. It shows how much uh, pulling power you have, Henry. I'm very impressed <laughs> uh, to get such a distinguished panel. Uh, let me, I'm, I'm gonna be very brief and speak for only five minutes or so uh, to give, I guess, the listeners uh, a kind of a preview of the book. And I, I would say that to explain the book, I'll make 
uh, three points about the, in a sense, the 21st Asian century. And the first point I'm going to make, which may sound a bit paradoxical, is that uh, all of Asia uh, should send a thank you note to the West for creating the Asian 21st century. Uh, and I say that quite honestly, genuinely, and sincerely, because if the West hadn't succeeded first, if the West hadn't created this magnificent scientific revolution, if the West hadn't launched the Industrial Revolution, if the West hadn't come up with these sort of breakthrough ideas on how to transform society, you know, like Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and free market economics and all these ideas that in a sense have propelled the West and made them the strongest and dominant, uh, most dominant civilization in the world for 200 years in the 19th and 20th century uh, are now the same ideas that are actually propelling Asia forward uh, in the world today. So, and, 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 the, and, and the Asians were very intellectually honest. Uh, they would admit that if the West hadn't made these major intellectual breakthroughs, uh, maybe we would still be in agricultural feudal societies today, but it's the West that's transformed the world and it's the West that's transformed Asia. And as an aside, I will also mention that we should also thank Japan for being the first Asian country to modernize and transform itself because the Japanese transformation also inspired many other countries, the Four Tigers, then subsequently the ASEAN countries, and then China, and then India, and all, all of Asia opened up. So you can see how, what a tremendous job the West has done in creating this uh, Asian 21st century. And so this brings me to my second point, which is that at a time when this Asian century launched by the West, is taking off, the West should be celebrating the success of Western ideas in Asia. Instead, sadly, the West is doing the exact opposite and both intellectually and politically refusing to accept the fact that the 21st century will be the Asian century. And I want to also, as a historical aside, mention that the return of Asia was always a natural development because from the year one to the year 1820, the two largest economies of the world were those of China and India. And as you know, I document that in some essays uh, in the book, uh, Asian 21st Century. And so the return of Asia was always going to come anyway. And so this is an inevitable return and the West should accept it gracefully. But unfortunately, there is, to my surprise, a tremendous amount of resistance to accepting this. In both intellectually, you will still have Americans saying, oh, the 21st century will remain the American century, which I find rather strange. And then, the, of course, you also have on in the political side, a deep reluctance to give up privileged positions that the West has enjoyed in the world order. And of course, exhibit A, is the fact that even to today, despite pronouncements to the contrary, uh, the United States insists that the head of the World Bank must be an American, and the Europeans insist that the head of the IMF must be European. I can tell you in 2009 at the G20 meeting, uh, during the global financial crisis, the West said, no, 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 this is all gonna stop. We're gonna select leaders of the World Bank and IMF on the basis of merit, and no longer the basis of geography, nothing changed. 12 years have gone by and we still have the heads of the IMF coming from Europe and the heads of the uh, World Bank coming from the United States. This is just one example of the reluctance of the West to accept the fact that this is a different world. So all this brings me to my third point, which is that actually there is a wiser, more intelligent approach for the West to take in the 21st century. And that's why you notice in my book, the Asian 21st Century, the concluding section uh, is on multilateralism. And, and you mentioned that I've been ambassador to the UN. I've been ambassador to the UN for over 10 years, and I still am. I was then, and I still am, many years later, still a passionate lover of the United Nations. And the paradox here is that the United Nations and its ideas and the UN Charter were essentially created by Western thinkers. It's Western ideas, Western concepts, and the UN General Assembly was conceived to be the parliament of man representing the views of the whole world. 
And so in a sense, if you want to create a more balanced world order to reflect the new world, we don't have to reinvent the world. We can just take the 1945 rules-based order that the West created and work with it. And so, you know, in the population of uh, 7.8 billion people in the world, only 12% live in the West, 88% live outside the West. If you want to know how, the, what 88% are thinking, you don't have to go very far, go to the UN General Assembly and, and use the UN General Assembly as a parliament or man to listen to what exactly the world wants. And the good news is that most countries in the world, especially in Asia, want to cooperate with this rules-based order that the West has created and actually want to have a more stable world order. And you mentioned China. China has become the biggest beneficiary of the 1945 rules-based order. Therefore, it's in China's national interest to preserve this rules-based order rather than to disrupt it as many fear would happen. So actually, if you do want to create a peaceful and safe Asian century, we don't have to go far. Let's go back to the 1945 rules-based order. And that's the concluding argument of my book in the Asian 21st century. So thank you very much, Henry. I'm looking forward very much to the dialogue with this very distinguished panel you've established. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kishu. Yeah, thank you for the point that you just made. I mean, uh, uh, absolutely. I think we are now in... Uh, in the 21st century, and uh, an Asian has been uh, developed, uh, precisely as you said, uh, for the last 76 years of, uh, uh, you know, after the Second World War, we ha had a new this uh, new Britain Wood system uh, that China actually <laughs> embraced on that. Of course, and now we have uh, after 76, 77 years, I mean, the system needs to be uh, 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 upgraded, of course, and uh, we have actually China has uh, outgrown you know, from a very uh, backward economy to the second largest economy. So I think that uh, absolutely, you know, uh, President Xi just gave a speech last night on, on, at the Davos uh, World Economic Forum. Basically, President Xi stressed again multilateralism and wants to, uh, uh, you know, uh, support, support the globalization and China wants to play active role on that. So, so I think that, uh, you know, this book probably can rouse a lot of a discussion and the rethinking of how we can as you said, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to work together. And, uh, uh, you know, even on the same system that was designed and the logic designed and, and uh, uh, architected by the U.S. So, so but how can, how can we do that? So perhaps I, I, I would like to uh, introduce maybe uh, Professor Kent uh, Calder, you know, which is also a good friend of mine. And uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I haven't uh, seeing you during the pandemic, but I still remember your time coming to CCG and to our conference, and we visit you in your office in, in DC. I'd like to introduce a bit of Professor Ken, and he's the interim vice dean for education and academic affairs, and also director of uh, Richard Shower Center of East Asian Studies of John Hopkins School of, of Advanced uh, International Studies, SAS. Uh, of course, prior to SAS, uh, Professor Kent also served as a special advisor to the U.S. ambassador to Japan and also the Japan chair at the Center for Strategic International Studies, CSIS, and also professor at the Princeton, uh, as you are now in the Princeton also, I noticed. But, uh, but Professor Kent, you have, you have done a lot of study on, on Asia also. You, you lived in, in Asia. You, you have written books about Euro-Asia and uh, uh, and also, you have a, a you know also spend a lot of time in China. So, what what's your take on on this Asian uh, 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 rising or, or return to its uh, uh, you know to the to the main, main global economic scene and politically as well? And what do you see as the U.S.? I mean, this system was this, you know kind of U.S. Uh, largely designed, but 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 can the U.S. Uh, now have a uh, you know like a, uh, you know, President, she said, you know, the world is big enough, the, the Pacific is in big enough, can we really accommodate uh, two biggest Pacific countries, and also including you, that we can all live peacefully in this world? So what do you think about this, uh, uh, you know, the connectivity probably is the next biggest move uh, in, yes. the, in the global, global economy, and what's your, what's your point on that, <laughs> Professor Counter? Well, yes. well I, I certainly agree with the points which uh, Kishore uh, Ambassador Mabutani has just made. Uh, and I've also looked through the book. I certainly recommend the book to uh, viewers. 
uh, I myself, of course, for years, I've agreed very much that we have a global transformation underway. Uh, the first book that I did while I was uh, together with Roy Hoffheins at Harvard University back in 1982, uh, The East Asia Edge, uh, we were talking also about a global transformation, about the, a re the uh, a revival once again of the world that exactly as he mentioned, uh, Asia had been at the center historically and that that world uh, after the important and creative interlude of the industrial revolution and uh, many of the difficulties since that we are returning to uh, an earlier era. Of course, I do believe, I'll come back to this, that there's a key role uh, for the United States. It's a key power today. It will continue. I believe there's fundamental strengths, America's technology, uh, food supply, uh, energy supply, creativity. There are many enduring strengths that will continue to give it a role, but the world that we will live in certainly has many characteristics of the world that Ambassador uh, Mabubani uh, is laying out uh, in his book. Um, I can remember visiting um, uh, Shenzhen in 1978 and coming out of the station and there was virtually nothing there. And then of course, just before the pandemic, I was back in Shenzhen again and the home of much of China's great technology, skyscrapers already, a, a, a huge city. I could hardly believe the transformation. And I see this time and time again as I move to the cities of Asia that I've, I've seen really since the time I was a boy. I was in Hong Kong when I was eight. And then going back and seeing how different, or Singapore, of course, and you haven't mentioned Singapore in detail, but certainly it's a, a extraordinary uh, place as well. I've written about that. I was glad to see um, Kishore mentioning in his discussion of the rise of Asia, of course, China, but also Japan and the remarkable story of Japan's transformation of going back to Meiji. Of course, there were dimensions that the world regrets and Japan regrets as well, the militarism and all, but certainly the important potentially constructive role uh, that Japan can play in this major transformation in world affairs. Um, I, we keep drawing the dichotomy of Asia and the West and fundamentally in the sense that Kishore has talked about that, uh, talking about the huge share of mankind which is outside the West. This is certainly the case. I do think a piece of this transformation, and I'm sure Professor Brown will come back to this, also is uh, important transformations across the continent of Eurasia. Uh, China's rise, uh, to me, is really a remarkable thing that uh, shows is right, right at the heart of this global transformation. But uh, no doubt it's also been magnified by the collapse in the early 1990s of the uh, Soviet Union, the uh, transformation more broadly of the continent, the end of the Cold War uh, also, of course, created a different Europe uh, and the extension of the European Union and uh, other and NATO and so on considerably to the east and deepening ties in the last decade across the continent between particularly China and, um, and Germany, but uh, with the AIB and so on at an important point also with Britain. And so uh, there are certainly complexities, but the transformation of many parts of the world, not only Asia, also have to do with this significant global uh, transformation that's underway. And I do hope as we move to the future, I think it means exactly what uh, Ambassador Mababani has pointed out. It means a world which certainly is not unipolar and the bipolar dimensions, the uh, 
Um, you know, the, the United States and China certainly together have important roles, but there's tremendous instability as we have recently seen in, in that dynamic. I certainly hope for a world in which uh, China and the United States can have a more stable and constructive relationship. But I think that is in the context of exactly what uh, uh, Professor Mabubani mentioned, namely of a broader uh, multilateralism that recognizes the role of other uh, major global uh, powers and, and also the transnational dimension um, entities beyond nation states and the very constructive role that uh, creative uh, uh, states that understand the broader system exactly like Singapore, but certainly um, others that understand the system as a whole and don't have a stake in just uh, uh, some form of hegemony. I think all of those things are, are going to be uh, crucial to the future. And I look forward to our discussion today. Good, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken. I, I think you, you've been outlining all those uh, uh, kind of eyewitnesses of, of uh, what has been happening in Asia, in China, and Singapore, and Japan. Uh, you are the expert on Asia, also uh, uh, in the US as well. So you have been actually. Uh, witness all that, and actually, this has been, uh, you know, uh, the the big development uh, out, out of Asia in the last uh, several decades. But how the world view it, and how we really can mix that with the uh, 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 with the world development together, uh, and then uh, peacefully accept each other, it's really uh, uh, seems now to be a big challenge now since you know China, U.S. had this uh, uh, trade frictions or even trade war in the in the last number of years, and. Uh, now we are still having this uh, uh, almost uh, bipolar world uh, taking shape. So, uh, so perhaps uh, I, I have uh, Professor Carol Brown to, uh, to 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 come in as well. And uh, and of course, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Carol Brown. He's a professor of Chinese studies and the director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. Uh, and also, he's a former diplomat and also worked in China. Uh, uh, China section of the Foreign and the Commonwealth Office, and also uh, worked here in the embassy, UK embassy in Beijing. Uh, but also at the, uh, uh, on the, you have lived in China also in Mongolia for, for 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 two years too. So you have read many books, and uh, and also your, your your new book, China Through European Eyes, we're coming out in May, and we're really looking forward to that uh, uh, great book that you've been uh, you know. Uh, coming up with so 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 uh, so, so Carrie, wh what's your take of about you know here the what uh, uh, Kishu and and Ken have just uh, said? So what's your take about this uh, uh, you know important growing relation of Asia and how the world can and get along, including China and and what what what's your view on those issues? Uh, Carrie, please. Thank you very much, and I'm a great privilege to be here with two such distinguished colleagues and experts. In the United Kingdom at the moment, we're mostly obsessed by whether our esteemed Prime Minister partied much last year or not. So I'm afraid <laughs> lifting our heads to look at bigger issues is a bit of a luxury. But I mean, this is an important issue. And um, I've got two comments. Uh, first is really about what the outcome might be. And the second is, how did we get to where we are now? Um, Professor... Mabubani talked about, you know, the Asian century, um, in a sense, a bit like the Nash, you know, kind of equilibrium. It would be good if we had a century where everyone felt they were the winner, a human century, as it were. In a recent book on existential problems facing humanity, an Oxford-based futurologist, Toby Ord, didn't mention China, I think, once. He mentioned uh, climate change, nuclear proliferation, artificial intelligence and pandemics and meteors clashing into the earth, which is somewhat unlikely, but he didn't mention China. And yet we have got to this situation where China almost obsesses a large number of our political elite in Europe and particularly in America. And where even saying that we need to have dialogue has become a difficult thing sometimes. And that seems a strange situation to end up in. As Professor Calder 
has said, it's not like we have uh, just arrived at a moment when China is prominent. This has been happening for 40 years. And yet, despite all of the evidence and the economic indicators and all of the you know, accumulation of different uh, very strong signs that China is becoming much more significant, suddenly there's this extraordinary panic. And I find that puzzling. An example is the very odd story of uh, a, a Chinese, uh, well, a lady of Chinese heritage uh, in the UK who has been accused of uh, trying to influence politicians here um, from our domestic security, MI5. I mean, if one looks at this story, it's very hard to work out what the story is. People try to influence politicians. Sometimes politicians try to be influenced. Uh, if we have a problem, it's the funding of politics and political parties, particularly in the UK, probably in America. And that seems to be more important than whether a particular person is trying to have influence, because in this case, I wouldn't say it was a very successful outcome. When we look at the really strange and panicky and, uh, you know, kind of weird situation at the moment, I do remember about 13 years ago during the great economic crisis, when Chinese investments sort of first really started to appear in London. And there was a lot of discussion in the media about how China was going to buy up the world. Well, of course that didn't happen. But what I do remember at that time were many people who were interviewed about, should we be worried about Chinese investment? Saying very strongly that this was not an issue because we set the rules in our own environments. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, about 13 years ago, Chinese investment first started to appear in Europe. And I remember at the time, the position was that we should not be worried about this because our rules and regulations were strong enough to deal with this new phenomena. And that seems, that confidence seems to have gone, uh, particularly here and in America and in Australia. There is this odd story of how China is a very, very strong threat to our values, our systems, and it seems to go a long way beyond the evidence. And it seems to make China into a problem, which is a different kind of problem to what it might be. This is not about Asia in particular, it's about China. I suppose the final thing then I have to say is that what really puzzles me in this situation we're in now is for Europeans, for Europeans, China and Asia are not new. We have been interacting for 500, 600 years. We have a long history. Uh, Henry just referred to a book coming out this year. It's actually not my book, it's a collection of the key documents by major European figures over the last 500 years about China. These are not China experts. They are major intellectual figures, Leibniz, Montesquieu, Voltaire, Marx, Hegel, Max Weber, Bertrand Russell, Roland Barthes. I mean, very significant figures who wrote about China. The pattern that you get over that 500 years is broadly two narratives, two stories. On the one hand, to idealize China, and the other, to be fearful and demonize it. Leibniz, I suppose, represents the idealization and Voltaire. They regarded China with its Confucian meritocratic system as a valid alternative for what Europeans were doing at the time in the Enlightenment. And that has continued down to the present day. On the other hand, figures like Montesquieu wrote of China as being an oriental despotic place that we shouldn't copy. Now, in the narratives that we have available, at least in Europe, and it seems to be the case in America and Australia too, I don't see that fundamental structure has changed. It's either to idealize, to look at China as some enormous trade and economic opportunity, or to regard it as a huge political and geopolitical threat. There are two problems with that to conclude. The first is if you regard China in particular, another part is in Asia too, 
as such major problems, how are we going to have a global system to confront the existential problems I talked about earlier? Which don't recognize and respect country boundaries. But secondly, with these very extreme narratives, we don't have the tools in our media, in our politics, in our public discourse and debate to deal with what is clearly a very complicated situation. We are trying to use pre-Newtonian physics to deal with a quantum era. This is very, very, um, you know, kind of uh, disastrous. So I think, uh, you know, finally, we've had the kind of introduction of relativity into physics. We certainly need it into geopolitics. I don't see why we are still haunted by storylines that were put in place 500 years ago that have not been radically contested. And I think that that is an urgent job. It's a job we have to do together to create a more adequate story and a more adequate narrative for clearly an enormously challenging period that we're all moving into. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, Carrie. Uh, uh, fascinating discussion. I mean, you you've been discuss, uh, discussing and also uh, talk about all those uh, historical views on, uh, on China, but also your uh, personal observations that this dichotomy that we are in, you know, this contradictory uh, we are in. You know, on, on one hand, I mean, uh, uh, Asia and, and China is, is rising, but on the other hand, the world is not uh, particularly Western countries uh, is not accept that. So, so. So there's a, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, you know uh, contradictory there, and uh, so what what I think you know for example Asian, Asian uh, you know for the last uh, half a century economically has been taking off. I mean Japan, uh, the four tigers, and then uh, and then uh, China, and uh, so economically they probably uh, recognize like also ASEAN is a, is a, is a marvelous success story. Like uh, uh, Kishu has written a book. Uh, in 2017, an ASEAN miracle. I remember we had a, 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 that book publication event in Beijing University, <laughs> Peking University. I was there uh, together with you. So, so we see that uh, ASEAN, Asian is uh, is rising, but politically, uh, is not you know, including China is is is, is not really uh, accepted. Uh, uh, you know, probably some ASEAN countries too. So, so what what do you think, uh, Kishu? You, you you think about you know, Asian economically. Is is doing well, and it will continue to do well, and we will probably become the economic center of the world in the next uh, uh, half a century. But but yet, politically and uh, also ideologically, as the Carrie Car Car mentioned, you know what what you know this narrative, uh, how we can really have a find a good narrative to describe that. I think Asian twenty first century is a, is a great start. You know we can talk about, but how we can really reconcile the differences between East and West, and how we can accept each other, that, that really is, is, is the key. So Kishu, do you have any uh, response for that? Yeah, thank you. First of all, I want to thank both uh, Ken Calder and Kerry Brown for their excellent uh, uh, presentations there. I think they've added a lot uh, to the discussion, but your question, I think, gets to the heart of the issue that we have to deal with, which in some ways also Kerry Brown touched upon we live in a world in which there are many immediate, pressing global challenges. And I'm glad Kerry uh, Brown mentioned that when his, uh, this Oxford professor was listing the problems in the world, China was not on the list of problems. But, you know, it was uh, climate change, uh, pandemics, and we can name all of them, you know. So the, the, the challenge we have is that there are two imperatives coming to clash in the 21st century. So the first imperative, which I think is the dominant imperative, is that the world has shrunk, you know? And we, all of us, 7.8 billion people, in the past when we lived in 193 separate countries, it was as though we were living in 193 separate boats with captains and crews of each boat. Now the world has shrunk and the 7.8 billion people live on 193 separate cabins on the same boat. 
And if you are a cabin on the same boat, there's no point taking care of your cabin if the boat is going to swing, sink because of climate change, if the boat is going to sink because of pandemics and so on and so forth, right? So we, the, the imperative to cooperate has become very strong and very powerful. And logically, if human beings were the most intelligent species on planet Earth, that's what they should be doing. But unfortunately, in the 21st century, another imperative is coming to play, which is the 2000 year rule of geopolitics, which states that the iron law of geopolitics, whenever the world's number one emerging power, which today is China, is about to overtake the world's number one power, which today is the United States, the world's number one power always pushes down the world's number one emerging power. And as you know, that's what my book has, China One, which is behind my shoulder is all about. And that's also the book that you, you kindly arrange for the translation in Beijing or in China too. So these are the two conflicting narratives that are hitting humanity. There's one imperative pushing us to cooperate. There's one imperative pushing the two great powers to engage in a major contest. And so I think here the solution therefore is you know, in, in, in my book, I devote a chapter to what I call the 6 billion people because out of 7.8 billion people, 101.4 billion people live in China, 330 million live in the US, there's still 6 billion people outside. So it's very important for the 6 billion people outside to try and persuade the US and China to press the pause button on the, on the geopolitical contest and focus on the common global challenges. So I hope there'll be more voices like the one that uh, Professor Kerry Brown referred to this professor from Oxford saying, hey, humanity has got much, much more pressing challenges to deal with. And that's what we should focus on. You mentioned ASEAN. If you could talk privately and secretly to the ASEAN leaders, and ASEAN makes up 650 million people, by the way, is a significant group. Their wish is for the United States and China to really stop this contest and help them deal with the more pressing challenges that they face, which is COVID-19, which is climate change, which is poverty, which is the need for development and, and so on and so forth. So I hope that there'll be more voices like the one that uh, Professor Kerry Brown referred to, speaking out and saying, let's press the pause button, everything else, let's focus on global cooperation. Thank you. Great, <clears throat> great, great. Thank you, uh, Kishu. You, you, you really outlined this well. So, so uh, you know, we had uh, in the past uh, 70 years, you know, the Western uh, uh, countries has really taken the lead and now the Eastern countries has really uh, catched up. But then the two <laughs> imperative, as you said, you know, <laughs> really get into a, a crossroad and then uh, uh, confront each other kind of, you know, we are in a, some kind of a, Trade war, tax war, decoupling, and all those things. So, so how can we solve that? I mean, uh, Professor Ken uh, uh, called. Uh, you you live in the U.S. You you see this happen. You see how we used to. You know, this actually marks the 50 years of Nixon visit to China. You know, this China U.S. Uh, joint communique. Uh, you know, you should uh, 50 years ago. And uh, but now we have seen this uh, a tight situation uh, with uh, with uh, you know cross street of Taiwan, for example. We see. Uh, U.S. actually has uh, 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 sanctioned over 600 Chinese companies already. And China has actually sanctioned none back yet <laughs> to the U.S. But, but you see, uh, you know, the, the U.S., is, as, as uh, uh, Professor Makabani said, you know, the, 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 the number one power is really uh, want to, uh, uh, you know, calm down on the, on the, the, the number one rising power. So, so there is a conflict uh, somehow there. But do we have a chance to work together now? Because with pandemic, it's it's such a you know we lose such a golden opportunity to work together. Also, the uh, U.S. is talking about uh, uh, build back better world B3W, and China has a BI as you are a, a BI expert too. So so the infrastructure has become the biggest uh, uh, common denominator of the world. Everybody recognizes the infrastructure is crumbling in, in some countries and and largely need in developing countries. Can the U.S. Including EU, EU announced the 300 billion euro uh, European gateway. So can, can we really work together uh, so that we can really uh, set aside these differences? Well, uh, you make very important points. I think the first thing uh, that I would say is 
we need to be realistic. There are areas um, where of deep, some areas of deepening conflict. Uh, for example, uh, in electronics technology, the um, civilian sectors and defense related sectors actually technologically uh, in areas like artificial intelligence, for example, possibly 5G and so on, they are coming technologically uh, closer together. And so there are some natural uh, tensions that arise uh, for that reason. That said, uh, I think the implication of that is there need to be negotiations. There needs to be uh, more dialogue uh, to deal with that particular dimension. Um, but uh, additionally, uh, I think there, there's a danger in this kind of an era of transition. In some ways, there were even some parallels in the earlier um, transition from the, you know, the height of the British Empire to an era of a larger, a stronger American uh, role in the world. Uh, misperceptions, um, Richard Neustadt, paranoid, paranoid misperceptions, and so on. This kind of thing, and Professor Mavabani's also talked about this at times, this is easy to happen in a period of transition. So that means I think more, more dialogue and even some formal uh, negotiations, I think we could be headed into eras just as the US and the Soviet Union had in an earlier age of uh, strategic uh, dialogue between China and the United States. There are those dimensions, but let me put those to the aside uh, for the moment because I think the most, the more important one flowing from our discussion here is, as Professor Brown put it, this is a cute or should be a human century. This should be an era, as Professor Mababani said, also of globalization. President Xi, of course, was mentioning these things in Davos and his earlier speech, I thought was eloquent in Davos two or three years ago on uh, related things, uh, related uh, issues. This is a global era. Um, and there are reasons to say, uh, to think if we look to the intermediate and long-term future, I think to be more optimistic. Demography has not been mentioned here. Um, of course, the, the West has, has, has grayed um, over time uh, and the broad and non-Western world, of course, has a much younger population. Uh, but particularly places like Africa and South Asia and so on, even China, certainly Japan already, uh, and Korea is beginning, there, there will be a time uh, 20 years hence or so, 15 years hence, when China, the de demographic change and the larger role of uh, senior citizens in society will become more important, which points to uh, one thing which I, as a faculty member of Johns Hopkins University, which is very much in the healthcare and the medical area, I can't help thinking about, of course, we've been significant as well in the Coronavirus Resource Center and trying to understand this pandemic, which is before us. I think healthcare is really a key area, uh, especially if we look to a 10 year, 20 year time frame. Those that have gone before can certainly uh, uh, have lessons for those coming. Uh, Japan in that sense has some things to say, I should say for the West, possibly for China, for other countries regarding the, uh, the, the problems, the challenges of healthcare and what to do. Uh, we need cooperative research. Um, it seems to me it's a tragedy that we have so much of the world population which is not yet vaccinated uh, against COVID-19. China has certainly played an American role, an important role, and uh, with vac it has its vaccines. The United States has developed some I think it's fair to say impressive uh, vaccines as well. And, and there's a European dimension to this. There's a lot more we can do uh, on the COVID issue, 
potentially cooperatively. And this is in the interest of all of our nations, because as we've already seen with the Omicron variant coming out of South Africa or the Delta variant coming from India, that the whole world can be threatened potentially by uh, this, you know, the, the uh, variants in COVID-19. We need better cooperation in that area as well as other parts of healthcare. Let me say just a word about infrastructure because you mentioned it and I know that we agree on this point. In my uh, supercontinent book, which I'm gratified uh, will be published soon uh, in China, um, I talk about the uh, infrastructure needs of the whole continent in, in, in detail. Uh, and of course, China has played a pioneering role. I think as grand strategy, there's no question for China, the Belt and Road Initiative is, is a uh, astute grand strategy. It also has broader global implications that I think on the whole uh, are positive. Um, I develop an idea, uh, distributive globalism, uh, essentially that rather than thinking about zero sum conflictual uh, regulatory ties, you do this, we don't do this on say trade policy. It's far more constructive to distribute resources. Of course, every problem cannot be solved that way. I, I do, as I said, I believe there are certain areas where we have to be realistic, but uh, infrastructure is not a zero sum area, it's a plus sum area. And uh, many uh, of the initiatives that China has made are important. You mentioned Build Back Better, also European Gateway. I think the major uh, parts of the world understand very well. And Singapore has also played a significant role in, um, in uh, relating to an infrastructure also. So, um, Possibly even thinking we have the AIIB, of course, we have uh, the uh, Development Finance Bank in the United States. There are a lot of new institutions. Would it make sense, and I think you have spoken about this also, to think about a global infrastructure fund or global institutions, to, as well as healthcare uh, promotion? institutions from a broad multilateral point of view. I think we need to uh, be thinking outside the box in terms of some of the new uh, institutions, the cooperative institutions in the area of uh, healthcare and infrastructure. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Ken. Yeah, uh, I think your, your, your idea of uh, distributive uh, globalism is, is, is also uh, uh, a very interesting idea, and uh, and actually now we have this, uh, uh, you know, the 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 infrastructure is is where <laughs> I think the world is all badly needed. Actually, I just talked to your colleague, uh, uh, also is a good friend, uh, uh, David Lampton, uh, not too long mm -hmm. ago. He wrote a book about the <laughs> I River, about this China and Laos railway, just recently opened the last month. So 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 I think you know this this China starting connecting ASEAN countries. Uh, already by railway now, so so this is really. I think we we have to find big things to work on, uh, and big hope to have for. Otherwise, we uh, you know to to we we are going to lose the you know lose the uh, confidence of of build up the relations, and that is really bad. So we have to work you know climate change, uh, 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 infrastructure, and pandemic particularly. We we really has to work. So I agree with you. You know that's all the urgent issues. Uh, both China, U.S., and you, and uh, we, uh, the whole world is to get work together. Uh, and now I would like to turn to uh, to to Carrie now again. And uh, I, I know you, you know you and I we've been in the, uh, getting quite a few dialogues on the uh, China you know the dialogue on China you know <laughs> DOC and uh, and also on uh, South China Morning Post uh, webinar bars and we, we see this uh, these two narrative. Uh, for example, the, the, the U.S. is emphasized on the. Uh, uh, American style democracy, and we see also China is holding democracy uh, forums, and uh, so, so actually, you know, the rise of Asia, the rise of China, 
I mean, economically, it's fine. It's only the ideologically and also the governing style, uh, particularly the value that, that, that seems Western has problem, particularly for China. So how do you think we can reconcile this? Because, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the Western democracy also, we see some uh, challenges problem too, like January 6th, what happened on the Capitol Hill. But you see, the, 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 the democracy system works in China. We also, we had a meritocracy, we had, uh, uh, you know, a consultative democracy, we, had the, we have a consistency, we've been working from one five-year plan to another five-year plan, and, uh, and also with those the modern decision-making supporting system. You know, the system can be as effective as, uh, as a Western democracy, as even more so probably. Let's compare with the uh, uh, KPI of all the performance of the country. So, so what do you think, how can we really, you know, make uh, peace with the, these two narratives, or maybe how accept each other, particularly for the West or South China, on these value and, uh, and uh, ideological issues, uh, which you are very familiar with? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a tough, tough question. If I were to be extremely flippant, I would just leave this question for the next generation or two okay. or three. A bit like Deng Xiaoping, I think, said about, you know, certain political issues. I think on Taiwan, he said, just leave it for the next generation or the generation after that. I mean, um, because if you were to sort of have someone arrive on this planet from Mars, um, who knew nothing but could speak, obviously communicate with humans. I mean, I think they would work out pretty quickly that uh, there's one group broadly around the United States as the most powerful that has one view. There's another group broadly around China as the biggest economy, but not necessarily very politically aligned with China. But, you know, these groups don't agree. That's all you could say. They don't get on and they don't agree. And they don't um, need to try to pretend they get on. I think it's important to stop trying to pretend because we've got enough issues that dictate how we're going to behave. Climate change doesn't care about values. Pandemics don't really care about values. Um, government responses to the pandemic have not really varied massively, whether they were democracies, non-democracies, whatever system, uh, everyone has struggled. Um, and they've taken very, very different routes. China's route has been one. The European route has been another. They've all had um, some challenges and they've had some successes. Finding the vaccine, for instance, in different places uh, was, was obviously an important thing. So no one really wins in this. No one loses, no one wins. We all are kind of on a flat earth here. Um, and I think that's really important that we give up on this idea of uh, there being a conclusive debate about which values are preferential. Uh, there are things that work and that don't work, and big issues now are going to dictate what we need to do. Um, we are wasting a lot of time at the moment arguing about these unresolvable values issues when we clearly have evidence every year of our climate being a problem. Uh, and Europe, uh, Germany last year had floods that killed many people. China had floods that also led to fatalities. So this is very, very uh, obvious and the same problem. Now, I think COP26 last uh, October is a good example um, because beyond all of the arguments about who attended and who didn't attend, Actually, the end result could not and did not, you know, solve the problem, but it gave a good basis. I mean, I think it's really good to look at COP26 and say it is much, much better to have an agreement like that, even though, of course, it's not perfect. It's got many, many problems, but it gives us at least something to work on. And without that, what would we do? And although there's going to be many arguments about how to get rid of fossil fuels, I think personally it's likely that China will move more quickly, but it clearly doesn't want to sign up to binding agreements at the moment before it knows what's going to happen. But it's in China's interest, as it's in the interests of Europe and America, to urgently do something about this problem. So we're all pretty rational, 
And I wonder if we were just to pause, you know, I think we should have a, a week when we don't have social media, when we don't have media at all, we just have a week of silence, global silence. And we kind of work out what really matters in that time. And as I said, and, you know, I, I'm respectful of the views of others here too, I think what really matters, uh, it doesn't matter if you're in China or Europe or America, um, you want a good climate, clean air, clean water and prosperity. And just finally, the very strange thing about domestic politics in Europe and America and China at the moment is actually they are quite similar. Britain is struggling with inequality and levelling up. America, obviously, is very big issues of the impact of the pandemic on uh, different groups and how unequal that is. Common prosperity in China, as I understand it, is also about trying to level up because there has been big inequalities um, during the reform period with some people gaining and some people losing. So there's a very similar agenda here. And finally, if we look at the kinds of economic challenges that the pandemic and other things are bringing, uh, it's gonna be a challenging time for everyone. Uh, growth is gonna be really challenged. Uh, there's no one that's gonna come out of this very easily. So I am interested in how politicians, in particular Europe, are going to be able to sort of maintain this strong conviction that we are in such a luxurious and strong position that we can completely ignore our economic interests and say we're not going to deal with anyone who doesn't agree with us. When, in fact, economically, we're going to urgently need to find new partners and sources for growth. And in the UK in particular, because of Brexit, we have obviously complicated our relations with our prime economic partners in Europe. The whole idea was, I thought, to have a global Britain narrative where we had stronger relations with China in particular, as the world's second biggest economy. And yet, in fact, we see this complete uh, ambiguity where we know that we need to have this stronger economic relationship because China is not a big investor in the UK and not our biggest trading partner by a long way. On the other hand, politically, we still think we have the luxury of having big arguments about issues which our politicians mostly don't really have much knowledge to deal with, not many of them. And secondly, wouldn't really be able to resolve if they were given 20, 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, this is a real odd priority. So I think we have to really be honest with ourselves in this. I think that's the most important thing for policymakers, to stop giving themselves the illusion of choice. On many things, we can't dictate what we can do. We can just understand how we're standing and what we are planning to do a bit better. Uh, but I don't think that we can give ourselves such ambitious ideas as to try and change the views of others about their values. That clearly isn't feasible, and it certainly hasn't worked so far. And I don't see any reason why it will work in the future. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, yeah, great, uh, uh, great, Kerry. Uh, that, that's that's exactly so. So you don't think this change in uh, uh, value can uh, can help or, or maybe influence each other? Uh, but 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 you know why China was constantly uh, be pressured to to you know on those issues, uh, uh, you know uh, human right or uh, you know issues of uh, democracy and things like that, because that was precisely uh, Western countries was persist on on China to change some of those positions. But 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 you're right, you know those are difficult. But but again, uh, as uh, Professor Mabani mentioned in his book, you know from year one to year 18th century. You know, Asian civilization, China was dominant, you know, the largest GDP war in the world. But for the last 200 years, China falling behind. Now we're talking about the rise and return of Asia, return of China. Can the world accept that? And how can the world accept that? And uh, what, what are the things need both sides to do? I mean, <laughs> that's again, the question I, I'm, I'm going to ask <laughs> uh, Kishina. So, so what, what, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't get an answer from uh, uh, Carrie, but let's see what we can do. Uh, about this, uh, you know, uh, rightful rise of of Asian and China, even though they are they have a different value in in a, in a different countries, even in Asia. I mean, Asia as a whole, 
does not have a, a, a unified value itself either. So it's it's diversified group. But but at least economically, their the integration will have offset getting effective uh, uh, this year, January 1st. It's the largest free trade agreement in the world now. And we have CPTPP, which is largely also Asian uh, country. In, in it. And we hope that China is also busy building up all those economic lines where China has also confounded with those military lines, uh, secure lines like AUKUS or, or, or Quad and things like that. But, you know, what, what can be done? You know, how, but also, Carrie uh, uh, mentioned about this, uh, you know, uh, climate change. And I mean, you know, it doesn't recognize value to climate change. But China, you know, on, 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 on this front, actually now develops, develops the most advanced technology now on the clean energy <laughs> Vehicle, automobile, the largest clean energy vehicle, the largest uh, solar power uh, producer, largest the wind power producer, largest hydropower producer. China is really uh, are doing fast on that as well. I mean, that can benefit the whole world if we really recognize each other right for existence. So how can we do that? I mean, I had all, all of you, perhaps Professor Marbani can give some further thought on that. Thank you, Henry. As usual, you raise very good, challenging uh, questions. You know, you know, when this session began, and I was asking myself, what would be the outcome of our discussion among the three of us? We have one scholar from the United Kingdom, one scholar in the United States, you in China and me here. We could have ended up, frankly, in this discussion with very divergent points of views, you know. But I have so far noticed in, in most of the points that are being made, a great convergence of views, you know. So for example, Ken Calder, when he says that infrastructure is not a zero sum game, but a positive sum game, frankly, if, if America builds a road, it boosts economic productivity. When China builds a road, it boosts economic productivity. It's a positive sum game. So both sides should build more roads, you know, and say, don't, don't see this as a zero-sum game at all. And similarly, I think the, the key point that I think Kerry Brown is emphasizing is about the pressing global challenges that we face. And th those are actually much, much more important. And we should all be coming together uh, to deal with that. So, I mean, if people were listening to this discussion, they would end up saying, hey, we can feel more optimistic uh, about the future of the world. But as you know, also, there are voices that are discordant. And, and that's why, actually, I, I'm looking forward to seeing very much the book by Carrie Brown on traditional European voices on China, the, those which idealize China, idealize China and those which demonize uh, China. There is actually a very strong, powerful constituency especially in the United States, which is demonizing China today. I mean, let's be very, very clear about that, okay? It's a very powerful constituency. And unfortunately, there's a bipartisan consensus of it in Washington, DC. There's a very strong element of it in the media also. And the net result of it all is that sadly, even though uh, it is the West that created the whole idea of trying to arrive at uh, understanding through reasoning and scientific analysis. A uh, reasoning and scientific analysis has flown out of the window when it comes to trying to understand China in today's uh, political context. I mean, especially I would say in the United States, but I think as Gary Brown's also hinting is on some extent in UK and Australia too. And the, and the tragedy here is that there's absolutely no reason for there to be a clash even on values between China and the West or China and America, because China is not exporting its values to the West. <laughs> the West can keep its values. It can remain democratic. It can preserve human rights. China, China is not trying to change any Western society at all. And China, as we know, in Southeast Asia, has actually stopped exporting communism from the time when Lin Xiaoping came to Southeast Asia and met Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and they agreed, okay, Southeast Asians would choose their own uh, political systems. And at the end of the day, the best thing that the Western societies could do is to say, okay, let history decide which are the best political systems, okay? And time will tell. And as you know, in my book, I say that if, if, it, if this really is a contest, a black and white contest, 
between democracy in America and authoritarian systems in China, then the West can relax, it's gonna win. But if you look functionally at American society, American democracy, as I document in great detail, has become a plutocracy. And that's why there's so much unhappiness among the bottom 50% in America. And Chinese society has become a meritocracy, right? And, you, and the Chinese Communist Party has managed to get the really um, remarkably them the best minds in China to serve in the Chinese Communist Party. So it produces very intelligent public policy, public policy solutions, including on climate change. So it's, it's how you define the debate also is very important. So the best thing you can do, frankly, and this goes back to my very, very first point, let's just press the pause button on all these disputes and focus on what's really, really important today. I think this is what Ken Calder was emphasizing. This is what Kerry Brown was emphasizing. You know, when issues of climate change are staring at us in our face, every year that we race is very dangerous, you know. We should be focused on common hum human challenges. And I'll, and I'll be very happy to call it the human century if we all agree, okay, we come together, 7.8 billion human beings, forget our American identity, our European identity, our Asian identity. Just remember that we are all an endangered species on planet Earth. That will be a fantastic outcome of this discussion. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Kishu. Actually, uh, you know, when, when, when those uh, uh, tycoon, you know, from uh, Tesla or Amazon, when they fly, fly on the, the outer space, when they look down on Earth, you know, they felt that <laughs> the whole global village, you know, it's all human beings. I mean, we're not, no, no difference at all. Uh, absolutely. You, you talk about this protocracy and, uh, uh, you know, uh, that reminds me about the U.S. It is it's one percent. You said it's it, you know <laughs> governor of the one percent by one for one percent. It, it's true. You know, the, the the middle class for the last thirty years, as as you stated in the book, has not gone up any anywhere. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in its uh, income, uh, whereas China has been very careful on that. You know, like President Xi come up for the last ten years, he tackles the most. Uh, the last, you know, 100 million extreme poverty, the most difficult part, and totally eliminate that. That's really a, a, a big achievement. And also now they're come calling for the common prosperity, basically is now looking at the 300 million migrant workers in the cities, you know, fast delivery boys or DD drivers and things like that. But now in the US, as you, as you said, if 50%, bottom 50 hasn't really gone up. I, I noticed that the, the term, you know the one percent of Wall Street, also the first ten tycoon of the of the Wall Street. Their their wealth has been, you know, uh, you know, has hugely increased even during the pandemic. Yet, you know, this uh, the, the the American you know multinationals business making business worldwide, and uh, they are not benefiting probably much of the of the Rust Belt and the Midwest and things like that. So the the local. Like I was talking to Martin Wolf, he said business become, uh, uh, you know, global and politics become local. They are keep uh, uh, voting out uh, anti globalization politician to to the Congress in Washington, and and bashing China and, and scapegoating China is the only surviving successful strategy for the politics. So how we can really turn that? I mean, China is, you know, trying to help. China already donated, you know, support provided two billion doses uh, vaccine to the developing world. And yet, China is, you know, blamed uh, uh, in, in the West uh, very often. So, as you said, there's a group of people who demonize China very much. How, how can we change that? I mean, uh, Professor Calder, you are living in the U.S. And uh, how can we do on both sides? Probably China also has to uh, get better on its narratives, get better explanations. And, uh, but, but, but this economic globalization has really created such a big challenge where China is taking a lot of blame now for that. And, uh, well, and trade war with example, yes. You know, as I said, uh, one thing I think we do have to realize that in some ways there are forces, technological forces that are driving us toward the uh, greater conflict. Uh, we have to have some degree of realism that the, I would say, particularly the next 10 years is going to be a delicate uh, period a uh, transition period. Uh, so we can't, I mean, of course, that's precisely it to me what drives the importance 
of a broader vision, a broader, more effective vision for uh, what can be done, which I think it has to be more concrete. And it involves a broader uh, understanding in the West, I, I would say, in, in, including in the United States and within the United States, including those parts of the country that exactly as you have said, uh, have not benefited from recent developments. Uh, I know that you, I was very interested that you had spoken to Angus Deaton, who uh, was a colleague of mine for many years at Princeton uh, University. And of course has written, uh, I think very eloquently about the problems of the American uh, working middle class, working class and so on. Um, so some part, and of course, much of the tension, uh, the, the actual tension, I think in US-China relations, much of it is driven by security tinged issues and by things like technology, but the political side the political edge on the tension, which in some ways actually is quite irrational, I think is driven by the deepening frustrations of our uh, working class. And by the, uh, you know, in the Midwest and the Rust Belt and so on. And it's a difficult, uh, some of these things need to be done indirectly or through, for example, global funds or through global initiatives that go beyond simply uh, US-China relations, I think, um, it, it, because the, the global perspective, I think politically speaking inside the US probably could in the short run have more salience. That said, it needs to be combined I think by something very exactly what you are uh, doing here uh, with the Center for China and Globalization, you have had, I think, some very uh, impressive dialogues with uh, people, opinion leaders. Uh, some of them, of course, are the globalists, uh, our common friends, you know, of course, uh, Joe Nye and, and uh, Tom Friedman and so on. But also, as I said, I was very interested you'd spoken with Angus Deaton. And I think reaching out, your role, uh, which of course presents some of the important uh, things that uh, uh, China has done, a reforestation, um, the uh, yeah, electric vehicles uh, that and well, including the role which you have allowed for foreign investment, including American investment, Tesla, if I'm not mistaken, has one of its largest uh, factories in the world uh, in Shanghai. So um, I think understanding a vision uh, for the kind of world that we need, in that vision, some uh, appreciation and um, uh, increased information about the th important things China has done. Some uh, attention to the issue of dialogue with, it, with mid our middle class and uh, increasing the understanding of our, our including our working class, uh, which I think is politically somewhat pivotal in the United States, even though they, their actual direct conflicts uh, with China, I think, are far less uh, than is often thought. So it's a complex question of uh, improving uh, relations. Uh, but I think the multilateral context, together with an attention to economic prosperity, shared prosperity, and uh, issues where we do uh, have common views like uh, infrastructure and health care, I think are quite crucial. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Ken. Yeah, you mentioned about Angus Deaton, you know, the Nobel laureates from Princeton. Yeah, I had a dialogue with him a few months ago and uh, he, he, he impressed me very much with his very solid uh, research that he actually studied the American, you know, he's, for example, the life expectancy of the U.S. is dropping year or two, year or two, year or two now than before, whereas China's life expectancy is only a year or two apart from the U.S. So it's, there's a lot of uh, things that uh, makes, uh, make his work very impressive. And 
Uh, but uh, but I'd like to you know also finally ask uh, 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 Carrie and uh, you leaving UK and uh, and UK now get out of EU and talk about uh, global Britain. So do you think that uh, UK still have uh, uh, you know a, a lot of a role to play? I mean rather than playing AUKUS, we would like to see UK play more in the CPTPP. Maybe you know talk with China and let's let's revive Asia on those uh, on those positive things. You know, we may have, you know, as, as uh, Kisha mentioned, we can we can maybe tolerate different values and system, but economically, uh, everybody <laughs> share the same benefit and recognize the value of that. So, uh, so what do you think about UK can can do in terms of, uh, uh, as now uh, you know you have a big influence in the, in the, in the West in US, Five uh, I and and also now, Prime Minister is talking about have a good relation with China. So how can UK play a unique role? Uh, in, in balancing all those uh, differences? Yeah, I mean, so the integrated review produced by the United Kingdom as a foreign policy document last April uh, kind of tried to look at all of our foreign policy issues and spell out a bit what the global Britain kind of story was. Um, I think it's a good document. I mean, it's probably one of the best ones that this government has produced. Um, and, you know, it there sort of spells out this idea of a relationship specifically about China being, you know, collaborative, competitive, and then adversarial. So that's the same structure as the United States. I think Anthony Blinken used the same kind of division um, in, uh, you know, speaking last year. Uh, and it's the same in European Union documents. Um, the problem is that where do we agree with each other on where China is collaborative, where it's competitive and where it's adversarial? Um, because everyone has a different view. Now, I think for the UK, we will um, be uh, led by where our economy goes. Because the whole logic of Brexit was we would get out of, you know, uh, one set of relationships so that we could then become a different kind of trading, investment, and uh, economic entity. Um, we have signed free trade agreements with Australia. I think Japan, they have not delivered a great deal. The obvious one would be with China. And we, in theory, should be able to uh, be free to sign such a, a deal. Um, politically, of course, that's really hard at the moment because politically, uh, the United Kingdom is having a difficult time with China. Uh, and it's also needing to show that it is aligned with the United States. Um, and I think this will not be resolved until we are clear about the economic impact of the pandemic and of leaving the European Union. As I said earlier, if our economy is very um, compromised and uh, you know, kind of negatively impacted, by both of those things, and I think it will be, then I think we're going to be very pragmatic. The United Kingdom has a strong kind of strand of, you know, business is business and other things are other things. And at the moment, there's a big tension. Uh, part of the government wants assertion of, you know, our special values, of our role in the world, which I think is <clears throat> ambitious and I think unrealistic. But there's also strong support for uh, being pragmatic, uh, doing uh, work uh, on investment um, and on uh, the, the economy. As I said, Chinese investment in the UK is 0.7% of our investments from abroad. That's small, that's, that's very, very small. And also um, Chinese exports uh, to the UK are far more than Chinese, uh, than British exports to China. Uh, that's actually increased in the last two years. It's become worse. So we should do a lot. And if we don't do that, a lot of the reason for why we exited the European Union becomes even more mysterious. Uh, we're meant to improve our relations in terms of trade and investment uh, with partners like China. Uh, but if we say, in fact, we can't do that because of other reasons, that's a very different story than the one that we were telling ourselves even a couple of years ago. Um, I think my personal view is that I think our politicians will speak differently 
when the um, seriousness of our economic position is much clearer. And I don't take a great deal of attention to what they say at the moment, because I don't think that anyone knows what's waiting for us. If the economy is slightly better, OK, we'll probably carry on in the position we're in now. Uh, I, I suspect that that's not likely. OK, great. OK, thank you. <laughs> so so there is there's always economic uh, in the, uh, corporate integration, but also the, the, the difference uh, uh, will remain. So. Uh, finally, you know, we have a, you know, five, six, seven minute now I, I uh, left now, I think before we conclude, but, but I, I think we have very uh, fascinating discussion, very stimulating discussion. We talk about this, uh, uh, you know, the Asian 21st century, the, the, the return, the rise of Asian and China, for example. Uh, but now the final question I would like to ask three of you, uh, you know, uh, to give, because just now uh, Ken also said, you know, this next 10 years is going to be probably a very, very challenging. And uh, so what do you think of, uh, you know, when would we reach a new equilibrium? You know, let, you know, okay, we can peacefully <laughs> coexist. We don't bash each other so much. Finally, Western would accept uh, 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 China as a grown up and, uh, you know, and <laughs> now uh, treat it as, a, as an equal, not really bashing each other. I mean, I talked to Joseph and I, he would say, okay, maybe by 2035, we will see another, uh, a new, 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 uh, new world of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, mutually acceptable. Uh, so, so Kishu, what do you think? I mean, you think you know now we talk about the return of Asia, <laughs> rise of China. Why would the world accept you know this uh, this reality? I mean, uh, how long do you think we're going to take? Uh, on the five years, ten years, fifteen, twenty? What you know that'd be really <laughs> interesting to know uh, uh, those uh, those issues. So. So we, we love to really talk about that. So Kishu paper probably can start. We will probably have two minutes, three minutes each of you. Yeah, yeah. I think since we only have five minutes, I'll give a one or two minute response. First, I want to completely agree with uh, Ken Calder when he said, let's be realistic. <laughs> and you know, as you know, the thesis of my book as China One is that the next 10 years, there'll be very rough relations between China and the United States. And I think that as a given, okay? But at the same time, I think after you come out of the storm, there'll be a big storm. There'll be a realization that China's rise cannot be stopped and the return of Asia cannot be stopped. And at the end of the day, if you ask me what is going to decide everything, it will be data. So if the IMF shows that China's GNP is now number one and United States GNP is number two, that changes the whole picture dramatically. And, and that's, and you know, and that's the profound changes happening in the world in terms of economic weight and power, I'll just end with two statistics. In the year 2009, uh, China's retail goods market was $1.8 trillion. United States was $4 trillion, more than double that of China. By 2019, China's had grown to $6 trillion. United States was $5.5 trillion smaller than China's. So this is what is going to move the markets and going to move the world. And I'll give you another piece of data that everyone should also know. In the year 2000, Japan's economy was eight times the size of ASEAN. Today, Japan's economy is only 1.5 times the size of ASEAN. By 2030, ASEAN's economy will be bigger than Japan's. <laughs> okay, so you can see how the world is being changed by this incredible economic shifts of power. And by 2030, the data will show very clearly that power has shifted to Asia. And I think that's when people will say, okay, let's start making pragmatic, realistic adjustments. And I want to emphasize, this is my last point, neither China nor Asia want to dominate the world. They want to work with the rest of the world. Thank you, Keisha. So. Uh, so, so uh, uh, Professor Ken uh, Calder, please. Yes, well, I, as always, I find uh, 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 Professor Mababani's work uh, stimulating. He's been one of the most important uh, commentators on this, this transition that we have now. And I like his new book, as I have several of uh, everything else, more or less, that he's done. I very rarely disagree with him, but I there's just one small cautionary note that I think we should introduce here. 
um, namely demography as it work. Uh, we, uh, and I as a Japan specialist, I suppose I'm particularly sensitive to this, but we should be aware of straight line projections. I have no doubt that uh, we are coming into a new era where the, uh, the non-Western world once again will move to preeminence, similarly to what was historically true. There will be a different balance within the non-Western world and demography uh, will play a, a role in this. I have thought for many years that the grand strategy of China is astute and uh, th that many of the initiatives that have been done have been, I think, right for the, for the present and, and uh, the future, but the, the balance, demography is going to play a role in balancing. Um, Japan has, uh, you know, um, has, has declined uh, economically. Um, Europe, uh, European growth uh, uh, slowed down, American growth slowed down. At some point it, within the non-Western world, probably uh, China certainly will be the largest and pr the most significant, but China's growth is going to slow also. So, um, and I think actually that will help to produce uh, what we're all projecting of the a decade hence, um, a greater stability in international relations. Uh, Asia will be preeminent, but there'll be a different balance within Asia, I think, uh, than we have seen uh, in the past. And so that too, I think is in the end will turn out to be a positive thing. It takes us back where we have been saying all along, I think cooperative projects to make it easier in the short run infrastructure and health uh, and to, to uh, negotiate and have China better understood during this period of difficulty that we're in now. Yes, thank you, Ken. And uh, Carrie, please, your prediction, <laughs> your con conclusion, yes. No, no prediction, I, I mean, but just to sort of uh, reinforce what, what uh, Ken and Kishore uh, have just said, um, I, I mean, I think it's important, the, the work that you're doing, uh, Professor Marbani, is um, important because we need to, I think in Europe and America, people have not quite got it, you know, this fundamental change that's, that's been happening for a long time, but it's now really real. And I think we should be less sensitive with ourselves. You know, we have this big, big kind of worry when we hear that uh, there might be a different kind of power, but it's not, um, it's not the sort of power we fear it to be. There are other challenges, but I think, you know, the ones that we're worrying about are not the ones that really are worth worrying about. It's something very different. It's a world of complexity we're moving into, and the complexity is the problem, not the idea of, you know, a new power coming and dictating, like, what everyone's going to do. I mean, that would be easier to deal with i mean but we are looking at a lot of complexity so i think the messages of your books are ones that are obviously challenging for people to listen to in europe and america but we have to listen to them otherwise events will simply overtake us and that um in the last couple of years has sometimes been what's what's looked like it's going to happen so we have to make sure we get on on top of things again particularly our somewhat worried and anxious feelings. Um, so I, I do appreciate the work that you've done and the dialogue we've had today. It's very important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so thank you all uh, three distinguished uh, uh, you know, guests very much. And I think we are, we are you know, almost come to the end. But I think we had a you know, fascinating discussion. We talk about this new book, The Asian 21st Century, and also the return of Asia, and then also the the future of Asia, for example, and also the, its relations and its implication for the world. I mean, actually, the, the two weeks from now, we will have a, a Beijing Winter Olympics uh, starting now. And uh, so 14 years later, actually, after 208 Summer Olympics, Beijing become the oldest city that hosts the both Winter and Summer Olympics. And uh, so 208, we see China initially embrace the globalization. China initially debarked on the global stage and then embraced the globalization <laughs> And, and also, uh, you know, China actually emerged from the, from the world scene. And then that, that is kind of a welcome, of, of course, by the international community. And of course, then we see the 208 financial crisis 
So really symbolize the, 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 the rise of uh, Asia and China probably in the last, you know, next uh, 14 years. But again, you know, Winter Olympic, again, it's another occasion uh, that uh, China is, uh, is uh, coming, coming to embrace the world. So we hope that uh, this Winter Olympic will still serve as a great uh, uh, reunion of the, of the world and, uh, and so many uh, athletes and, uh, and the country represented will come to China, even during the pandemic. So we hope that uh, we, we will still have a lot of dialogue, we still have a lot of exchanges, a lot of uh, uh, sportsmanship. And, and also I really like the, the new motto for the Olympic uh, this year, you know, uh, since they actually use that Tokyo Olympic, you know, faster, higher, stronger, together. So that's together is really important. <laughs> so, so I hope that, uh, you know, we, we felt so thankful for all of you taking the time to talk to us. And I, my staff was telling me there's 100, 150,000 people uh, watched us online. And uh, so, so it's really fascinating. I mean, we will continue the dialogue. We'll bring down the differences. We hope the next 10, 20, 30 years will peace for time and uh, uh, let's all uh, work together. So thank you very much and uh, thank our audience and thank our staff. So thank you, goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Bye. have a good time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.